Unlike most people I imagine whose excitement for Baldur's Gate 3 stems from their love of the originals, my interest comes from a different place as I was extremely young when the original games came out so I never actually got the chance to play them, they passed me by a little bit. However, I do have a decent amount of experience with the 5th edition of D&D, and the idea of a game made by Larian Studios, made within these systems with the D&D lore, is very very appealing for many many reasons. They have already said that they are going to be using the player's handbook as a base for building the game with a few added systems on top to make it work in a video game environment. So it follows on from that that there will be the other books that are going to be added in as well, in particular the base ones like the Dungeon Master's Guide, but also the Monster Manual, and there are many, many interesting creatures within the Monster Manual that they could implement, and so this video is going to be the top 10 creatures that I would like to see from the Monster Manual implemented into Baldur's Gate 3. So coming in at number 10 we have the Pit Fiend, and if this was talking about devils just as a whole, uh, they would quite possibly be at number 1, at least in the top 3. Uh, but when talking about individual creatures, the Pit Fiend, the very pinnacle of what the devils are all about, the leaders, second only to the Archdukes and Archduchesses of the Layers of Hell of course, the sign of a Pit Fiend is a sign that the Nine Hells are featuring heavily in Baldur's Gate 3, and that's one of the reasons why I do hope that we see one because the devils are just one of the most interesting aspects of something very compelling about the Nine Hells in general, and the Pit Fiends themselves obviously are a very high level creature, one of the most devastating monsters in the Monster Manual, and while this isn't a list of the most powerful creatures in the Monster Manual, having a certain X factor to you is certainly not going to hurt your chances of getting on the list. And the Pit Fiend of course is sort of a battlefield juggernaut, it's very charismatic, it's very strong, very intelligent, all of the sort of things that you can do a lot of interesting RP things with, and also, as if that wasn't enough, it also has access to a small repertoire of spells as well, with sort of hellish fireballs and walls of fire, also hold monster is another good one, so it has a decent amount of utility to it as well, it's not just a hulking brute that gets sent into melee, uh, it has more to it. You know, you can definitely make a character of a pit fiend, as well as having them be a multifaceted threat in a battle. So coming in at number 9 we have the Mimic, and while the Mimic is certainly not as strong as the Pit Fiend, I would still certainly like to see a Mimic in Baldur's Gate 3, and I'd be very surprised if it wasn't. I mean, is it really a D&D adventure until the furniture in any particular dungeon that you're plundering suddenly tries to eat you? I think not, and Mimics are also fairly popular in the gaming environment recently with obviously... Dark Souls very much leaning very heavily into the Mimics, but of course a Mimic doesn't have to just be a chest, it can also be a table, a door, any sort of furniture, um, and I'm quite interested to see if Larian are willing to be a little bit more creative with the Mimics, and obviously again, like, just Mimics are a little bit different to how I think most people see them, like, they are a sticky monster, like, once you're sort of trapped with them, they'll stick to you, and it's very difficult to get away from them, and... Ultimately, I feel as though there's a relatively high chance of at least one Mimic showing up in Baldur's Gate 3. Like, this is certainly one of the more likely monsters on this list, which I feel like is going to show up, because it's just iconic for D&D, and like I said, would it really be a full D&D adventure if we didn't run into a single Mimic? So coming in at number 8, we have the Mighty Tarask, an enormous creature, gar gargantuan size, and in terms of challenge rating in the Monster Manual, and I think of any books that have actually been released since the Tarask is, in the minds of the people who made 5th edition D&D, the hardest monster that there is at a challenge rating of 30. It has a huge health pool, massive armor class, all of the things you'd expect from a high level monster, and really my desire to see the Tarask in the game come down to more morbid curiosity as to how Larian would implement a gargantuan sized creature like this into the game, and it might as well be the Tarask. I mean, there are a couple more, especially in some of the uh, additional books that have come out later, um, but this is sort of running off the assumption that the Monster Manual will be what they primarily use. And I mean, who doesn't want to see the Tarask? I mean, it's got the highest challenge rating, even if it's just a sort of little side quest that's sort of near to the end of the game, uh, where it's like a sort of optional super boss, as it were. I mean, I know that MMOs and JRPGs tend to have those, and while I'm not the biggest fan of those two genres, I think that this is the perfect fit for that in many ways, and I just want to see what Larian do with a creature like this, to be honest with you. Something so massive, something so powerful that levels entire cities. You know, I'd, I'd be interested to see how, they, how they'd implement that. 
So coming in at number 7 we have the Gelatinous Cube, and speaking as someone who has run D&D campaigns in the past, the Gelatinous Cube is absolutely one of the most fun creatures that you can throw at a low level party. Oozes in general, I'm sure that there will be an ooze somewhere, and the Gelatinous Cube is, I think, the most iconic of all the D&D oozes uh, that there are in the Monster Manual. But obviously the Gelatinous Cube, there's got to be at some point early on, there's a room with suspicious swords suspended in the air and you think, oh, there's a bit of free loot in here, I'll just go in there and pick them up. And as soon as you enter the room, you're engulfed by the ooze and you immediately start taking acid damage. It's, it's too good an opportunity to pass up. Like, speaking of someone who has DM'd games in the past, the Gelatinous Cube is such a fun thing to use, it, especially for an early level monster. Like, a lot of the sort of really interesting monsters that you see later on, you think, oh man, I can't wait to get to that, but there are creatures at the lower end which are super fun to use, and the Gelatinous Cube is absolutely one of the best for that. And it's not the most powerful creature in the world, certainly if a party is paying attention, the Gelatinous Cube could certainly prove to be a bit of a non-event. But there is always the potential that you walk into it and start taking acid damage, and, you know, one or two party members even may get dissolved if you're not being careful. So coming in at number 6, we have probably the creature on this list which is least likely to show up, and that is the Aboleth. The Aboleth is very much a Lovecraftian beast, very much akin to Dagon from Shadow over Innsmouth, very, very much like the other aberrations. You know, the aberrations do tend to draw from inspiration from H.P. Lovecraft, and certainly the Aboleth does. There will be more aberrations later in the list as well. The Aboleth, though, are creatures which bat the gods before time began, so to speak, and were defeated, and now they plot their return, essentially, they're sort of trying to re-establish their dominion over the mortal realms. I don't know, I feel as though there's a lot you could do with an Aboleth. I mean, if, if Larian did want to get creepy with it, I do feel as though, ultimately, however, that the Aboleth is probably the sort of creature which might show up in a, a subsequent DLC or follow-up adventure, because it is very much the sort of creature that you would expect to have a whole adventure based around, rather than it just be a sort of side excursion. Um, but even so, I mean, a man can hope. I, I certainly, the aberrations just in general, I, I really like the weird lore to them. And the Aboleth can certainly count itself as one of the most interesting of the aberrations on display in the Monster Manual. So coming in at number five, we have the Vampire, which in my opinion is the most interesting of the undead in the Monster Manual. I do, I do count the Lich in that as well. I just feel as though there's more you can do with a Vampire. I feel as though you can have them be more of a fleshed out NPC rather than a sort of evil old hermit of a mage which has lived for millennia underground and is jealously guarding his phylactery. I feel as though with the vampire you can make them much more part of the community that you can build and you know with the world that Larian is building if they can implement vampires here and there um, it could be the sort of thing they just weave right on in. Anyone who's watched Critical Role after all will remember the uh, the Briarwood arc from Campaign 1. I mean, that's the sort of thing you can do with vampires. It's, it's, you know, the potential to be very interesting is there, and I'm sure that there will be higher level undead of some description within the campaign, and considering that, my hope would be that that is the vampire, because it is my favourite undead uh, that there is in the book, certainly in the Monster Manual at any rate. So coming in at number four, we have the genies, the nobles of the elemental planes, and technically this is four different creatures, but considering they are a subset of elementals, I figured it would be worthwhile to just put them all in as one, because it's very difficult to sort of pick a favourite out of all of them. They are very different, though, to be fair, like the Dao, the earth genies, the Marid, the water genies, the Jinni, the air genies, and the Efreet, the fire genies. All of them have got very different personalities, but all of them are super interesting, and just in general, I feel as though... You know, there's again a lot you can do personality wise with a genie. They're not just an unthinking monster. Like, obviously, standard elementals are very much just like living fire or living water. But with a genie, you can have, in particular, a fantastic antagonist. Like, you can make them this sort of overlord of slaves. Like, all the genies, regardless of what their disposition are, they, they very much like collecting servants and slaves uh, of particular worth. And again, this changes from genie to genie what they look for in a slave. And again, there's always the possibility that if you outwit them, if you trap them, they will grant you wishes if you capture a particularly powerful genie. So there's stuff you can do with genies which you can't do with other creatures, and it's one of the reasons why I hope that at least one finds its way into uh, into Baldur's Gate 3. And if I had to choose, my personal favourite would be the Marid. While they are my least favourite stylistically, in terms of personality, I feel as though there's a little bit more you can... They're a little bit more my speed, the Marid, the water genies. So coming in at number three is cheating, really, because they're already confirmed to be in the game, because they are the creature that was displayed 
in the trailer that Larian released, and it is, of course, the Mind Flayers, or the Illithid, as they call themselves. And I'm really glad that the Mind Flayers are going to be making up a good portion of this game, just because, again, they're so, as villains, they're so sinister, they're so interesting, there's a lot of interesting lore about them. The way that they devour their prey, they attach their tentacles to the head, sort of ex extend a sort of lamprey-like tongue, and sort of get into the enemy's skull and then devour their brain. I mean, there's something so wonderfully creepy about that sort of creature. Uh, there's a lot of interesting lore to them as well. I mean, there's almost a sort of sci-fi-like element to the Mind Flayers in many ways. Obviously, again, there's the obvious Lovecraftian sort of influences as well. It's a very interesting sort of marriage of all sorts of fantasy concepts, sci-fi concepts, and Lovecraftian concepts. And again, it, it's so good for me that they're, they're going to be in the game because they are one of my favourite creatures just in general. A lot of great lore to them. And I hope that they... I hope that they make up as big a portion of the game as the trailer would suggest. So coming in at number two, it would be an extreme surprise if they weren't in the game either, because after all, they are in the title of Dungeons & Dragons. It is, of course, the dragons. Ancient dragons, to be specific, because that obviously means that we're dealing with the highest level of dragon. And again, I've had enough of my expectations being subverted for now. I, I, I want an ancient dragon in the game, preferably chromatic, because again... I feel as though, in particular with dragons, considering their greedy nature and just their, their power and their arrogance, it suits to have a chromatic dragon in the game a little bit more, I think, because again, having these monsters that are intelligent and evil aligned, I feel as though there's so much you can do from a villain perspective with regards to them, and especially a dragon. I mean, you know, it's, it's massive, again, it's such a tour de force, but also intelligent. It has You have the ability to talk to it. And that, I feel as though, is one of the main draws of D&D, the fact that you can you can go into an encounter and you don't necessarily have to just kill everything. You can actually talk to the creatures first, and that's one of the reasons why many of these creatures on the list are villains that have a higher intelligence score. So you've got the ancient dragons, of course, and then the genies and the aboleths and the pit beans and that sort of thing. But obviously, with a dragon, it, it's classic. There's got to be a dragon in the game at some point. You would imagine it would be an extreme disappointment if there wasn't. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, I prefer chromatic as well, but I'd certainly be okay with a good aligned dragon as well. Metallic dragons, there's a decent amount you can do with them as well. We'll see, but I would be willing to bet a significant amount of money that we will be seeing a dragon at some point in a Dungeons & Dragons game. But at number one, we have the Beholder, which again is arguably the most iconic of all the D&D monsters. I mean, it's on the front of the Monster Manual. Again, this is another creature that I would be extremely disappointed if we didn't see a Beholder at some point, but it's so it's so quintessentially D&D &D that I would be extremely surprised if a Beholder didn't show up at some point or another. And of course, again, most of this comes down to how interesting they can be. Xenophobic isolationists, they're called, although some of them do form sort of vast, evil empires beneath the earth. They come from the Outer Realms, so again, there's a sort of element of the Lovecraftian about them. You only have to look at them to see their Lovecraftian influence. Again, there's a little bit of the sci-fi about them as well. There's just so much about the Beholders to admire, and a lot of this does come down to the fact that, again, I have DM'd games before, and the Beholders are such a fun creature to use. Like Of all the creatures in the book, the Beholder is most certainly my favourite, and it is my sincere hope that uh, in Baldur's Gate 3, Larry and Dane, to add a Beholder to the game, because... Again, the Beholders are so good. They're so alien, they're so interesting, they're so different. And again, that's, that's one of the things about D&D and about many of the creatures that are on this list, like the Mind Flayers, like the Genies, like the Devils. They're so D&D &D in nature. Like, there's no other fantasy world that would have a Beholder. And again, I know that's because there's copyright laws, I'm sure, that uh, <laughs> if uh, other universes could get away with having a knockoff Beholder in their games, they would. Um... I mean, come on, there's got to be a Beholder in the game, surely, right? So that's going to do it for the top 10 monsters from the Monster Manual that I hope make their way into Baldur's Gate 3, and it was a difficult list to make, honestly, and that was without adding Volos and Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes on top of that would have been even more difficult if I had all of those to choose from as well, although I still think the Beholder probably would have come out on top. I love the Beholder as a monster, it's so cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is a little bit off base for what I usually make on my channel, but... You know, I, I hope that it's somewhat interesting to some people. I mean, I have a little bit of experience with 5th edition D&D, &D and yeah, I am looking forward to Baldur's Gate 3, even though it may be a long way off. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this and found it somewhat informative into what my opinions are on Baldur's Gate 3, if that's of any interest to you whatsoever, and I hope you will join me for whatever is next.